A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. Hey everyone, Dr. D here. Welcome to Genetics 2416. And the book we are going to be covering this semester is a book by Pierce, Benjamin Pierce. And that book is this one here. Genetics Essentials, Concepts and Connections, 4th edition. We're going to start off with Chapter 1, an intro to genetics. So to start off, we have some overarching themes here. We have the importance of genetics, the history of genetics, and the fundamental terms and principles of genetics. So we're going to be touching on each of these chapter concepts in chapter one. So let's go ahead and start with that first concept, genetics and the importance of genetics. As you know, uh, as most people know, genes are important for life. They're vital to life. Uh, in fact, some would claim that you live to pass on your genes. And uh, an organism's fitness is dictated by its ability to pass on its genes. And you are the result of generation after generation after generation of genes being passed down from you know, parents to children, parents to children, in an unbroken chain of life since the beginning. So genes influence not just your life, but everything that makes up your body, your Her your heritable traits, uh, your, the color of your eyes, the color of your hair, but not just the color of your eyes and hair, but the uh, your your it can affect your personality, uh, your height, uh, everything about who what makes you you is dictated ultimately by your DNA and the genes that make you up. So they are fundamental to who and what we are. So genes dictate how our bodies develop. And if there's a mutation, that means a change in the genes. Those changes can have adverse effects on our body. It can have deleterious effects on your development. Here's an example. This is uh, an x-ray of a normal hand uh, at, the, you know, uh, at the top left. And here is an x-ray of a hand where this person inherited a mutated gene and that gene was important for bone structure. This gene is called diastropic dysplasia gene and when this diastrophic dysplasia gene is mutated and you inherit that mutated version of the gene, now that gene's product, its protein product, uh, which is a sulfate transporter, doesn't function correctly. And as a result, you end up with curved bones, shortened limbs, and hand deformation. You see here, you see the hand deformation. So there are many examples of genetic diseases and genetic disorders that you can inherit. But one thing they have in common is that you have genes that are either mutated or deleted or something has been altered in the normal coding of those genes on the chromosomes. And you guys hopefully remember from Biology 1406 that we have a certain number of chromosomes and chromosomes are double-strand DNA that house the genes. A gene is simply a portion of a chromosome. So if, if what we're looking at here is chromosome 5 in your body, well, there would be a host of genes on each chromosome. Each chromosome houses thousands of genes, right? So the diastrophic dysplasia gene I was telling you about lives on chromosome 5. It resides on chromosome 5. So on my chromosome 5, you would find this gene. On your chromosome 5, you would find this gene. On everyone's chromosome 5, you would find this gene. And this gene is normally involved in producing this protein, coding for, I should say, coding for this protein 
the novel sulfate transporter. And when this sulfate transporter is created correctly uh, and it functions correctly, this results in bones being formed correctly. And when this transporter's gene is mutated, that means that this transporter is not created correctly and it's not doing its job correctly. And in that case, you're going to get these deformities. So hopefully that makes it clear as to why these genes are important. These genes are important because they code for these proteins, proteins including transporters, enzymes, etc. And those those enzymes, those proteins have jobs in your body. Those proteins are very, very important for what makes you tick. How you develop, how you look, how you formed, how your bones formed, how your eyes formed, how your hair formed, how your skin formed. So you can see how a gene mutation can lead to a phenotype. If something is happening at the gene level, that's called your genotype. If something is happening at the protein level uh, and above, that's called your phenotype. Here's another example. Have you heard of sickle cell anemia? You and I, uh, if you're in the wild type category, that means the, the normal category, we have hemoglobin beta gene. And this hemoglobin beta gene codes for hemoglobin protein. Hemoglobin protein is the major protein inside of your blood cells that helps to carry oxygen in your body. Now, when you have sickle cell anemia, uh, one of your genes, the hemoglobin beta gene specifically, is mutated at, I believe, the sixth residue. And this mutation results in a misshapen protein, a misshapen hemoglobin beta protein. And because hemoglobin beta is not folded correctly, it has an exposed hydrophobic region, and so it still carries oxygen. However, this causes multiples of these hemoglobin proteins to stick to one another because of this exposed hydrophobic region, and that stretches out the cell, and that causes sickle cell shape and sickle cell anemia and all of the uh, debilitating parts with that are associated with that disease. So again, when you have a genetic disorder, this means that the wild type, the normal gene has been mutated and that mutation in some way affects the phenotype, meaning the protein and the function of that protein. So hopefully this makes sense as to why these genes are so important. Uh, another reason genes are important is in agriculture. Just look at everything that we eat. It's far cry from what it was. You look at a modern apple. It's not exactly what our ancestors ate. You look at a modern banana. It's not exactly what our ancestors ate. People have been selecting for better crops, more genetically robust crops, more drought-resistant crops, insect or pesticide resistant crops uh, for generations. And uh, these crops have been a, uh, a, a, a wonderful uh, benefit to humanity because now uh, crops can grow where they couldn't grow before. Uh, they can grow larger uh, with bigger fruits than before. Here's an example. Uh, Norman Borlaug, Nobel Prize uh, Nobel Peace Prize 1970 for his work with, with wheat. He was uh, able to find strains of wheat that gave, uh, or new varieties of wheat that were better for harvest. Look at the, on the right here, this is a rice plant. This is a traditional rice plant on the right. You can see here that it doesn't yield much rice, but then here's a high yield rice plant. You see a genetic variant of that plant. So the ability to identify um, uh, favorable traits in these plants, in crops, and then select for those uh, and, and use those to increase food supply. This is an amazing use of genes. Uh, the, the whole GMOs, uh, genetically modified organisms nowadays. Now we can go in and not just select for 
more robust plants, but now we can actually edit the genes ourselves or introduce genes ourselves to make these GMO plants or GMO animals. And these are able to, again, feed more people. Biotechnology and medicine, think about that. We have uh, genes involved in uh, biotechnology all over the place. Here's an example, uh, insulin. You know, a lot of uh, diabetics require insulin shots. Where do you think those insulin shots come from? Well, they were able to isolate the human insulin gene, put that gene in a plasmid, which is a circular piece of DNA, put that circular piece of DNA into a, uh, a bacteria cell, an E. coli cell, grow up vats of E. coli, and those E. coli are growing and growing and growing in these big vats, and on what they're doing the whole time is just spewing out insulin, right? They're they're because they, they have the gene for insulin. They're making the protein for insulin. They're making insulin protein, and and they're just shaking around in these vats making insulin protein. And what we do as scientists, we purify those insulin proteins and we uh, bottle them and send them out as medicines, right? So there's a prime example. E. coli has no business making insulin. It doesn't have a pancreas. In fact, it's a single cell creature. However, what did humanity figure out? Humanity figured out how to take that insulin gene from a human, place it in E. coli. E. coli shakes about, grows, makes the transcribes and translates. Hopefully you guys remember these concepts from Biology 1406. The E. coli is able to transcribe the insulin gene, translate it into insulin protein, and then what do we do? We harvest that insulin protein. Same with Botox, you know, in people that get Botox injections to prevent wrinkles. Um, what is this? This is a gene, the botulinum gene. They grow up vats of botulinum. They harvest that protein, the botulinum protein, and uh, they inject that into faces uh, for medicine. So you've got all these examples of uh, genetics being involved in biotechnology and medicine. I mean, just look at the current pandemic, correct? Uh, what's happening during the current uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Uh, obviously, this virus has uh, caused a pandemic. And, and what did these biotech companies do? Moderna, Pfizer, uh, you know, Johnson & Johnson, uh, what did we do? We sprung into action. And, and how did we do that? We took a gene, we took a gene, uh, this receptor gene, um, the spike protein, which is a protein on the surface of the COVID virus. And we took that gene and we created the mRNA copy of that gene right you guys know the the mRNA vaccines how they work from Moderna and Pfizer uh, they took the s the spike protein which is a again it's a protein from the surface of of covid there's a protein that lives on the surface of covid and they took the gene that codes for that protein uh, they transcribed it into mRNA, mRNA, and then that's essentially what the vaccine is. They inject you with mRNA. Your own cells translate that mRNA, that spike protein mRNA, into protein spike protein itself, the spike protein itself, and then your immune system is triggered because your immune system goes, whoa, what's this S protein doing in your body? I don't recognize that. And so your immune system mounts an attack against that S protein. Isn't that interesting? So uh, the, the, you can thank genetics for the COVID vaccine. Genetics is the whole reason the Pfizer and the Merck, I'm sorry, the Pfizer and the Moderna uh, vaccines work. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a little bit different. That is a more traditional vaccine in that it is an actual protein, um, uh, but it also required genetics because in that case with Johnson & Johnson, you inject uh, the gene into usually it's chick eggs, then the chick eggs transcribe and translate the uh, S protein into protein or S S protein gene into protein, and then you 
purify the protein uh, from those chick embryos, those chick eggs, and then you, you put those in vials and you inject that. So uh, your understanding of genetics after this class, if it, or uh, if, uh, as, you, as you continue your studies in biology and learn about molecular biology, biochemistry, uh, you're going to learn a lot about why genes are important. And, and when you learn these concepts, then you can apply them to real-life concepts such as uh, vaccines, you know, real life current event issues. What else? Genes are important in development. Uh, again, the whole reason a fly becomes a fly, the whole reason you became you, the whole reason a mouse develops into a mouse, it's, it's genetics. Uh, the, this is a, an image of a fruit fly embryo, and it's showing the expression of a gene in green. What they've done is they've attached a gl green fluorescent molecule to this uh, gene. And so you can see where this gene is expressed, okay, in the fruit fly, in the fruit fly, Drosophila. Um, by the way, when you see in the lectures, you see this on the bottom left here. Uh, when you see this little icon, that means you could click it. So um, if you have the PowerPoint, you can uh, click on this button and that takes you to another one of my videos that explains this concept in more detail. Uh, this one happens to be a video where I explain the importance of genes, just like I'm doing now. I'm telling you the importance of genes. Um, if you can't get the button to click, hold control and then left click and that'll take you to the video. But again, uh, not just in development, but... Uh, you know, in cancer, think about cancer. Cancer is invariably caused by uh, DNA damage, gene mutations, right? Um, the main reason uh, you get cancer is because of mutations in your genes. Um, the reason you develop uh, into, like I said, into a fetus and then into a child and then you develop into an adult is your genes. Your genes are directing your growth and development. It's very, very important stuff. And all of your genes together, again, they reside on chromosomes and then you have multiple chromosomes. How many chromosomes do you have as a human being, do you think? Do you remember from Biology 1406, how many chromosomes do you have? Uh, some of you are saying 23, some of you are saying 46. Well, it's you're both kind of right. There's two sets of 23, so there are 46 total chromosomes. There are 46 total chromosomes, but you have two sets of chromosomes. Uh, you inherited one set from your mom and one set from your dad. So you inherited a 1 through 23 set from your mom and you inherited a 1 through 23 set from your dad. So you have two homologous sets of chromosomes. Hopefully this is all review. Um, I do have a nice video on the difference between homologous chromosomes and sister chromatids which I'll show you in a little bit. But um, so you have 46 chromosomes and all of those chromosomes together constitute what? Your genome. You, you remember that term genome? Uh, well, the genome is all of your chromosomes. Uh, all of your genomic DNA is your genome. Okay, and here it says it can either be RNA or DNA. Now, this is a little bit misleading. Um, usually, if it's a living organism, the genome is comprised of DNA. Does that make sense? So, you know, the, do you guys remember the three domains of life? You've got archaea, bacteria, and, so archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. Do you guys remember that? The three domains of life. Well, all of them use DNA as their genomes, as their genetic material. Now, if you're talking about non-living uh, agents, such as viruses, you guys know that viruses are not living. They are not in one of the domains of life? Well, viruses can have genomes. Some viruses have genomes of DNA. Some viruses have genomes of RNA. Does that make sense? So 
you can have RNA genome viruses and you can have DNA genome viruses. But if it's a living organism, it has a DNA genome. And like I said before, the coding system for genomic information is very similar among organisms. What does that mean? The way your genome is read, okay, remember transcription and translation? The way the genes are read is this essentially the same in all organisms. This is why I could stick the human insulin gene I told you about earlier. This is why I could stick the human insulin gene from a human into, remember, E. coli. And then what does E. coli do? E. coli is able to read that insulin gene from me. Um, that's called transcription. Okay, and then it's able to convert that message into protein. That's called translation. So even though the insulin gene came from me, my E. coli friend was able to read uh, that gene and to make the proper protein. That's what they mean by the genetic information is very similar among organisms. The codons, do you guys remember that term from 1406? The codons are the same. The, the triplet codes of the genes uh, is the same between different organisms. Essentially, I mean, there are little exceptions here and there, but it's essentially the same among all organisms. So here's a concept check question. What are some of the implications of all organisms having a similar genetic system? Besides the one I just told you about where you could stick a gene from one organism into another, but let's look at it. A, that all life forms are genetically related. What do you think? I would say yes. That research findings on one organism's gene function can often be applied to another organism's. Exactly yes. That genes from one organism can often exist and thrive in another organism. Again, yes. So the answer would be D, all of the above. So let's continue on with the division of genetics. Okay, these are areas of study in genetics, uh, major areas of study. Now, a lot of people, when they think of genetics, they're thinking of transmission genetics, aka classical genetics. Essentially, this is the study of heredity, right? How, how does how do your genes pass on, right? How did you end up with brown eyes, or how did you end up with blue eyes? You know, why do you have curly hair when you know your mom has wavy hair, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. This is transmission genetics, but also uh, more and more popular these days, uh, and and more and more important these days. Uh, and by important, I mean um, an area of focus because these are this is where all the uh, the modern day uh, discoveries is happening is molecular genetics. This means looking at the chemical itself, the gene molecule itself, figuring out exactly how this the genes work and how the proteins transcribe the genes and translate the genes and and how the genes are silenced or turned on or you know if you've got if you guys have heard of CRISPR you know how does that all work and how does gene editing work right these are all things that have just been discovered uh, you know how is how, how do you how do you uh, map a genome how do you how do you solve the human genome all this stuff has just been discovered in the last 10 20 years so Another major area, another major division is population genetics. Population genetics. This is looking at populations. A population in uh, genetics, in biology, population means a group of the same species of individuals, right? The individuals of the same species. So if I'm talking about a population, if I'm a biologist, I'm talking about all of the fruit flies that's a population all of the here's an image of ladybugs right um all of the ladybugs that would be a population humans would be a population uh, fundamentally it's the study of evolution because you're looking at how does that population how does the genes in that population change over time and space okay so let's take a quick little break um, and we'll come back to talk about model genetic organisms and why these model genetic organisms are important in genetics. 
All right, welcome everyone. Welcome back from break time with Gizmo and Wicket. Where we left off, we were about to talk about model genetic organisms. Now, recall what I said earlier that life is related and a lot of the same genes are found in different species of organisms. So just like you and I have an insulin gene, well, so would a orangutan or a cat or a dog. All of these organisms have a pancreas. So a mouse, a mouse produces insulin. Any organism with a pancreas is going to produce insulin. Right, So you could study insulin in any of these organisms. Uh, a lot of genes are shared between organisms and organisms are related. And remember, uh, genes are read the same way amongst almost all organisms. So what that means is we don't have to study humans to make observations that are relevant to humans. We don't have to do experimentation on actual humans to learn a lot about what makes a human develop properly, what makes a human's organs function, what makes a human tick, right? So instead of studying humans, what scientists do uh, usually is study model genetic organisms. What are model genetic organisms? Model genetic organisms are organisms with characteristics that make them useful for genetic analysis. Why are they useful? They usually have a short generation time. Think about it. What is a generation time? Well, that means how long does it take to be born? How long does it take to grow? You know, wouldn't it be easier to study a mouse, for instance, that has a 19-day gestation period versus a human that has a nine-month gestation period? And not only that, how many babies are born to a human? Maybe one, uh, sometimes two, sometimes three. Um, that's not very practical. You're going to wait nine months for a baby to be born so you could study uh, whatever you're trying to uh, study, the genes that you're trying to study just not practical. Why not study insulin in a mouse? A mouse, 19 days later, it has pups. Usually a litter of mice is anywhere between three and sometimes like nine pups. And there you go. And, and a mouse becomes fully grown uh, in, in just months, right? Uh, in just months, you have a mouse that's an adult mouse that you could study. And then that mouse can uh, breed and that mouse can have its own pups and you could study multiple generations over the course of maybe a year. Uh, that's a lot more useful for study of, let's say, how the pancreas develops or how the pancreas secretes insulin. So a mouse would be a good model organism. Why? Because it has a short generation time. What else makes a good model organism? The production of numerous progeny. Again, I told you a mouse uh, has litters of between three and nine usually. Those are average lit size litters. Uh, so that's a lot more useful than, say, a human that only has one progeny. The ability to be reared in the laboratory environment. So, yes, uh, uh, you want your model organisms to breed and multiply in the laboratory, right? So where you can see uh, the, the, the organisms as they, you know, you could study them in vitro uh, or before birth. You could study them uh, shortly after birth. You can, you can monitor when uh, they were bred, you know, what day they were born, etc., etc. So knowing that, there have been six of the most intensely studied organisms. These are the main model organisms that are studied by the greatest number of labs. And this includes one we touched on earlier, the Drosophila melanogaster, which means the fruit fly. This is your typical fruit fly. Uh, there is also E. coli or Escherichia coli. You all know what E. coli is, a type of bacteria. You have Canorhabitus elegans, or C. elegans, as it's normally called. This is a type of roundworm or nematode. Then you have Arabidopsis thal. Thaliana, I should say, and this is a type of plant. Then you have Musculus. This is your mouse. 
and Saccharomyces cerevisiae. This is a type of yeast. Okay, so you have different model organisms, and all of these are being used in genetics labs across the the planet. Um, a lot of times, it makes me chuckle when people say, "Oh, there was a study, and but it was just done in flies." So what does flies have to do with humans? Or there was a study done in in yeast cells. Ugh. Well, that's that's not humans, but that statement is ignorant. The best studies come from flies. The best studies come from worms. The best genetic studies come from yeast. Um, model organisms have been used to crack some of life's greatest codes. Uh, the, the, so the biggest discoveries uh, in genetics have been done, have been found in these model organisms. Why? Because the same genes do so, the, usually the same functions in all of these different organisms. Let me give you just a taste of what people study these organisms for. You know, I was doing my graduate studies at UT Southwestern and a postdoctoral fellowship at UCLA, and some of the labs just around me, uh, we had fruit fly labs. Fruit flies were amazing for studying uh, inheritance. They were usually studied for uh, stem cells, uh, you know, they have stem cell niches inside and you could look at stem cell and how those stem cells uh, proliferate. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of times you could study development, development in the fruit fly as well. E. coli was amazing for gene expression, transcription, translation. Also, like I said, you could uh, use E. coli to uh, express human genes like insulin. C. elegans was amazing because they know exactly where every neuron is in this creature, so it's great for studying neural development. Arabidopsis was amazing for studying a process known as RNAi or RNA interference. Mice, man, uh, I my own personal research was done with mice. I was uh, making what are called knockout mice, which means you delete or mutate a gene in the mouse. So you make genetically modified mice and or genetically engineered mice, and then you study the effect of knocking out that gene. So why are mice important? Well, if you're studying an organ system such as the heart, such as the liver, such as the pancreas, such as, you know, the stomach, these are great studies to do in a mouse because it has such organs, right? It's, it's a mammal like us. My studies had to do with insulin production and pancreatic formation, right? And what about the yeast? Yeast is another type of eukaryotic organism. I was in a yeast lab for a while and we studied mitochondrial genetics. Did you guys know that uh, the mitochondria of a yeast has uh, DNA, just like you and I, our mitochondria has DNA, and that's called mitochondrial DNA, right? And that's a form of cytoplasmic uh, DNA, or non-nuclear, non-genomic DNA. Very, very interesting stuff. So if you want to understand how the mitochondria's DNA works, why not study a yeast cell? Isn't that interesting? Uh, so anyway, that just should give you a taste of how these animals are used as model organisms and why they are all good model organisms. They are all good because they are all useful in genetic studies because, again, they have short proliferation times, they can be reared in the laboratory, and they have, what was the third one? Short generation time. Short generation time, numerous progeny. Numerous progeny, that's a big deal. All of these proliferate quickly. All of these proliferate quickly and have great litter, big litters, right? Uh, th that makes them very useful to use in the lab setting. So good. Now again, when you're, uh, oh, here's another model organism. Here's another one, the zebrafish. Zebrafish are great. A lot of labs study the zebrafish. Why? Because you can look at uh, pigmentation. Okay, and you could relate that to human ethnic groups if you want. If you could study the melanin inside of the melanocytes in the zebrafish, so you've got a normal zebrafish that's able to produce 
all this uh, uh, melanin in the melanosomes, the uh, cells that store melanin. And you could look at the golden mutant, which is uh, which produces less melanin in the melanosome. So if you're studying skin, if you're studying skin uh, uh, conditions, so if you're studying the development of the skin, you know you can use zebrafish, and that's a great model organism to use there. Again, that's just another example of how you can study a model organism and then apply those results to humans. So here's another concept check for us. Would the, would the horse make a good model genetic organism? Why or why not? Well, you could try to argue, well, it's good because it's a mammal like you and me. It has a stomach and a pancreas and a liver and, you know, that's great and, you know, that'd be wonderful. But remember, you have to have what three things? Short uh, generation time. Uh, what's a horse generation time? You know, I'm not too familiar, but I could tell you it's probably in the years before it has its own children. So that's not a great model organism. It's also huge. You know, that's another thing. It's It takes a lot of space, so that's not good. And how many offspring does a horse usually have? So how many progeny? I think usually one, right? So that's not good. And then can it be reared in a laboratory? Again, most labs don't have giant barns attached to them, so, you know, probably not. You know, a small mouse cage, uh, you know, is about the size of a shoebox, uh, but um, a horse would take up, you know, a barn, basically. So that's not a good model organism. So again, no, because horses are expensive to house, feed, propagate, have few progeny. Generation time is too long. Okay, makes sense. Now, again... Humans have been using genetics for thousands of years. Uh, it's no new concept to uh, take organisms that have beneficial traits and then try to proliferate them more. If you have wheat, if you have a type of wheat that doesn't scatter, the seeds don't scatter, well, let's plant more of that. Uh, you know, the Assyrians, back B BC, 800 BC, um, the Assyrians were were picking dates and using and planting dates that had the better uh, uh, taste and, the, and, and had uh, desirable traits. All right, so people have known about inheritance for a while, but early on there were many misconceptions about uh, heredity. Uh, when, when people started turning their attention to how genes are inherited, they naturally made several errors. And here are some of the early incorrect concepts of heredity. One, let's start with this one, pangenesis, this concept of pangenesis, that genetic information travels from different parts of the body to the reproductive organs, okay? And do you know how this one was disproven? This one was ultimately disproven when tails were cut from mice for 20 generations and those mice continued to grow tails right uh, to have offspring with tails so if pangenesis was correct then theoretically chopping off a mouse tail that mouse should not be able to have a offspring with a tail but obviously pangenesis was shown to be incorrect Inheritance of acquired characteristics. This was another misconception. This was another incorrect concept of heredity early on. That acquired traits become incorporated into hereditary information. So, you know, think about the giraffe. The giraffe stretches its neck, stretches and stretches its neck to get to, get to the leaves. Well, then it would be able to pass on that, you know, uh, acquired trait, uh, it, it's something that it acquired during its lifespan, it could pass that on to the next generation and the next generation would have an even longer neck. So theoretically, if this was true, I could go and exercise a bunch and get big muscles and then my offspring would be born with naturally bigger muscles, right? So we all know that's not the case. So uh, the reason giraffes have long necks is not because their parents stretched their necks longer, it's that the ones with the shorter necks kind of died, right? So now we know about natural selection and we know about selective agents, right? 
and we know how it properly works. It's not because the giraffes stretched their necks, it's because the ones with the short necks died. What else? Blending inheritance. People thought that you were a blend of your parents. If there was a yellow flower and a and a and a I'm sorry, yellow flower and a red flower, the offspring would be like a mix, uh, an orangey flower, right? Now we know this blending hypothesis is not correct. You, there are red alleles, uh, red genes, and then yellow, yellow, and then you know the the offspring are distinct. They are not blends. You know, if if your mom had blue eyes and your dad had brown eyes, you're not going to have some mishmash of, of bluish brown eyes, right? You're going to have, or hazelly eyes. You're, you're still going to have brown eyes or blue eyes. It's just the concept of dominance and recessive there. Hopefully you remember some of those Mendelian, uh, uh, Mendelian concepts from Biology 1406 that alleles are inherited in distinct manner, right? Preformationism, this was another big one at the time, that this miniature organism or homunculus resides in the sex cells. So this would, this would, this would uh, state that all traits are inherited from one parent. So imagine the sperm cell and there's like a complete human being inside of that sperm cell. This was the concept of the homunculus, for example. And we all know that's not the case. The sperm and the egg come together. Each one is a haploid gamete. Those sperm and egg meet, forming the diploid zygote, which then divides through mitosis to give you a human. Okay, so to set some of those incorrect concepts straight, to find the real answers using science came the rise of science of genetics with these founders, some of these pioneers of genetics. Let's just go through and just touch briefly on each one and what they contrib con contributed. Again, very briefly, Mendel, we're going to be talking about him. Um, we already learned about him in uh, 1406, Gregor Mendel and his principles of heredity. Remember his work with the monohybrid cross, the dihybrid cross, and how those were uh, instrumental, fundamental to uh, uh, transmission genetics, right? Uh, that's why he's known as the father of modern genetics. He's the reason we know how these genes are inherited. Dominant genes, remember recessive genes, You've got the monohybrid cross showing us the principle of segregation of alleles, and then the dihybrid cross, the principle of independent assortment. Uh, so very, very important stuff. And then Schleiden and Schwann came along, and they showed us cell theory. Cell theory stating that cells uh, make up organisms, and organisms... Uh, and cells cannot be made from scratch. Cells come from other cells, and cells make up organisms. Fleming, who showed that chromosomes are the uh, are the the source of the genomic material, that heredity is based on the chromosomes. Darwin, who showed the evolution of uh, the theory of evolution through natural selection. Weissman, who showed the germ plasm theory. The germ plasm theory, by the way, the correct answer to the pangenesis concept. Remember, pangenesis was wrong. Weissman came along and showed the germ plasm theory. Remember with uh, chopping off the tails from mice for 20 generations and showing that the mice stubbornly still grow tails. Uh, the germ plasm theory states that you know, you've got the gametes, the sperm, the egg from the parents, and then those come together to form the zygote. So the information is in the uh, reproductive organs. They don't travel. The information doesn't travel from the tail to the uh, sperm and then be passed on it. The information's already in the reproductive organs, in the gametes. And then Sutton, that genes are located on the chromosomes, right? So very, very important pioneers showed that uh, the, the, how the proper inheritance of genes work, how genes function, 
genes are residing on chromosomes. Chromosomes are the genomic matter. The genomic matter is from the re reproductive organs. The reproductive organs are inside cells. All organisms are made of cells. The cells come from pre-existing cells. Okay, and that uh, uh, you know all life is is related. The theory of evolution through natural selection. You know that things have evolved over time. Okay, and all of those concepts are outlined on this table here. Make sure to take a look at this. Okay, now moving to the third part. Okay, we've talked about why genes are important. We've talked about what the history of the DNA is. And now let's talk about the fundamental concepts. Now these, these terms that you should remember from 1406 or that you should understand to be successful in this class. What's eukaryote versus prokaryote? Remember, we learned this in 1406. Eukaryotic cells uh, possess a nucleus. They possess membrane-bound organelles. Prokaryotic cells do not possess a nucleus. Instead, they have what's known as a nucleoid, and they do not have membrane-bound organelles. There's one domain of life which uh, consists of eukaryotic cells, and that's eukarya. And there are two domains of life that uh, consist of prokaryotic cells, and that, that's the bacteria and the archaea. Genes are a fundamental unit of heredity. Okay, so remember, a gene is the information to produce a protein. This is the most fundamental way I can say it. It's, it's you know, there's more to it than just what I just said, but essentially a gene is the unit of information required to code for a protein. So, for example, the insulin gene is the information your cell needs to make an insulin protein, right? To make insulin protein. Your, your cells don't know how to make insulin protein without insulin gene. The gene is the information for the protein, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. And your body has like 25,000 different genes, okay? So, so your body has 25,000 different genes, give or take. Those genes code for proteins. Those proteins have jobs. Those proteins are enzymes. Those proteins are transporters. Those proteins are structural. Those proteins are involved in cell division. Those proteins are involved in cell fusion. Those proteins are involved in signaling. Those proteins can be involved as receptors. Those proteins can be a host of different things, okay? And if you change those genes around, uh, if you mutate, those genes, which means change the code for those genes, you're not going to get the right protein made. And that, right pro and that protein may not fold correctly, that protein may not function correctly, and that's going to lead to genetic disorders or cancer, right? Genes come, from, come in multiple forms called alleles. So remember, you can have eye color gene, right? Eye color is a gene. But brown eyes would be an allele of eye color gene. Blue eyes would be a different allele for eye color, eye color gene. Does that make sense? So when I say gene, I mean like eye color. But when I say the blue eye allele, that means the blue eye version, the blue eye form of the eye color gene. Uh, genes confer phenotypes. So the blue eye color allele will give me the phenotype blue eyes. The brown allele, eye color allele, will give me the phenotype brown eyes. So my genotype would be brown eye gene. My phenotype would be the actual brown eyes you can see. Okay, genotype refers to what genes I possess. Phenotype refers to what you see. Okay, genetic information is carried in DNA and RNA. Okay. So, genetic information can be carried in DNA. Genetic information can be carried in RNA. This is why, again, uh, the, the RNA is just a copy of the DNA usually, right? The mRNA is just a copy, is a complementary copy of DNA. Why do you think the COVID vaccine works? They inject you with mRNA. That means a copy of the virus spike protein, right? 
your cells are able to read that mRNA that serves as information for your cells to make the spike protein. That protein is now made, right, from the RNA information. Okay, so genetic information is carried in DNA and RNA. RNA is just usually a copy of the DNA. Genes are located on chromosomes. Remember, humans have 46 chromosomes. The genes reside on the chromosomes. So again, uh, you have 23, 23 chromosomes from your mom. That's called a set. 23 chromosomes from your dad. That's called a set. Um, on those chromosomes, you have... You know, again, again, you have 46 chromosomes. You have 25,000 genes on those 46 chromosomes. Does that make sense? You have 25,000 genes on those 46 chromosomes. In fact, you actually, if when I think about it, you actually have 50,000 genes, but you have it, it. They consider it 25 because you have a like an eye color gene from your mom and an eye color gene from your dad, right? So you'd have two alleles, right, of that gene. You'd have a brown eye color gene and a blue eye color gene, for example. But that's still called one gene because you have 25,000 genes. Eye color is a gene, but you could have two alleles for every gene. Uh, so if you do the math, you technically have 50,000 different genes, even though there's 25,000 different genes. Okay, <laughs> I know that's a little confusing, but bear with me you have two alleles for every gene, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. And the genes are found on the chromosomes. So again, you have 25,000 different, uh, 25, different genes on 46 chromosomes, and that means you have thousands of chromosomes on each. Uh, oof, I keep getting this back. You have thousands of different genes on each chromosome. Does that make sense? Why? Again, because you have 25,000 genes, 46 chromosomes, so you have many, many genes on each of your chromosomes. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm getting backwards. So, remember these terms, chromosome, chromosome. This is one continuous piece of DNA. Uh, usually it exists as chromatin. Do you guys remember the term chromatin? The DNA, the chromosome DNA wraps around these proteins called histone proteins, and that's what chromatin is. Do you guys remember? Chromatin means your chromosome, your DNA wrapped around these histone proteins. That's chromatin. Okay, and chromosomes separate through mitosis and meiosis. Mitosis is the cell division. Meiosis is a different form of cell division that results in the gametes, the sperm and the egg. We're going to touch on that. Hopefully you learned that in 1406, but I do have some good videos that I review. DNA to RNA to protein. Do you know what this means? DNA to RNA to protein. This is the central dogma of molecular biology that states that DNA information flows to RNA through what process? Transcription. RNA flows to protein through what process? Translation. Mutations can cause permanent changes Right? When you inherit a mutated gene, that's permanent. When your genes get mutated, that's permanent. Um, you know, this is how cancer is formed. Do you, let's say you smoke, a gene gets mutated inside of your lung, that mutation is permanent. And if that causes cancer, those cells divide and divide and that mutation propagates and proliferates. Some traits are affected by multiple factors. Okay, and some some traits affect multiple factors as well. Evolution is genetic change, right? So gen gene change over time in a population is the definition of evolution. Okay, remember these are all fundamental concepts from 1406 that I want you to know. So that about wraps up chapter one. I hope most of it was review. If not, please, please, please review, read the book. Uh, try to refresh your memory on those concepts. Otherwise, that was chapter one, a very straightforward, short chapter. Let's hop into chapter two in the next video, and I'll catch you guys next time. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D.